Hi guys, so today I'm going to continue on with my series about the AS5600 and the I2C protocol. Now, last time I made this video where I bit banged by hand the I2C protocol and I entered it manually into the clock lines and the data lines of the chip. And uh, at the end, uh, I was able to get data from the angle sensor of the AS5600. And every time I clocked it in by hand and acknowledged it by hand, I would get um, 12 bits worth of data, a high byte and a low byte. And uh, that worked out very well. Now, at the time, I learned a tremendous amount about the I2C protocol and how to enact it to the point where if I had a microcontroller that I wanted to use for this project, I would easily be able to code my own library for it. Um, but... I also wanted to see if there was a way to do this in an automated fashion, not by hand, but without a microcontroller, and um, to implement the both the transmit and the receive protocol. Now, I know I said I was going to use this uh, in an all analog fashion for my digital sampler project, and I really did. And I made a little spinny wheel here for it, and uh, you get analog data out. And here's a snippet from my sampler project. So while I finish up the videos for the sampler project, um, I do want to try to automate this I squared C protocol, which has two parts, a transmit at the top and a receive at the bottom. So for the easier part of this protocol, I am going to try to uh, make a control mechanism or a driver for the uh, receiver, the data receiver. And so the data receiver, uh, as you can see for review, the SCL line, which is the serial clock line, is on top and the SDA is the data line is on the bottom. And you get eight bits of data per byte plus an acknowledge bit the angle sensor of the AS5600 magnetic uh, rotary encoder gives you 12 bits of data, basically from 0 to 496, 4096. And so um, every time you uh, receive data from the uh, AS5600 angle sensor, you're getting uh, 12 bits from the high, or uh, uh, four bits from the high byte and uh, 8 bits from the low byte for a total of 12 bits. At the end of every 8 clock cycles, the data line has to be manually pulled down by the uh, master device, and then an acknowledge clock signal has to be sent. In order to do this without the device freaking out, the clock signal has to be entirely encompassed by the data signal, which means it has to go high and then low. Uh, all within the same time frame that a data byte is pre a data bit is presented by the slave device, um, and so uh, in order to do this, we need to find a way to get a timer uh, to clock in eight pulses followed by a ninth pulse, and then that ninth pulse, uh, the data line has to be pulled down, and the clock has to go up and then down before the data line can be changed again in order to deliver the acknowledge uh, to the slave device and allow the slave device on the next eight clock cycles to be able to give you more data from the next available byte. And so uh, in order to do this, we would need um, two different uh, clock speeds, uh, one for the data line and one for the clock line, and the clock pulses have to be shortened with a gate to trigger converter. So the way I implemented this is uh, first and foremost with a CD4017 counter, uh, which counts from uh, 0 to 8, which is the uh, nine, 9 bits of information, and, um, and a 555 timer. The 555 timer... Um, the output of that is one is going to the CD4017 counter and the other one's going to uh, a D flip-flop in order to make a divide by two clock 
in order to provide the second uh, second clock speed and, and uh, make the circuit function. So attempting to make an automated interface for the I squared C to receive data. So the timing has to be right. So using this 555 timer, a D flip flop and a CD4017 counter chip, I can make nine clock pulses where the clock pulses are shortened and are triggered by an external trigger, this button right here. So if I push this button, we're gonna see it happen. Let me start the process on a different screen and let's see. Bottom line is the data line. It should go low on the ninth pulse and the clock is right in the middle of it. Here it is again. It should be data line is high and uh, it's gonna go low uh, for the acknowledge uh, period and clock it in. That. And then it stops and waits for the re-trigger with the button. So let's press that button again. Here it goes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that's it. Done. And it stops. Perfect. So now in order to shorten the clock pulses instead of having them encount, uh, encompass uh, the 67% duty cycle that I get from the clock circuit as I have it, I put them through a gate to trigger converter which can be constructed using a few discrete components, some diodes, resistors, a capacitor, and an op amp uh, that's configured as a comparator in order to give you a short pulse. I made a previous video about the gate to trigger converter, but basically the way this works is a differentiator circuit. The um, capacitor and resistor uh, make of the clock pulse, which gives you a positive and negative going uh, voltage spike. The two diodes get rid of the negative voltage and uh, the 220K resistor at the end of the second diode is a pull down resistor. The comparator just basically takes that short pulse and turns it into a clock pulse. That's the duration uh, of the pulse that you made. And it gives you a very short output pulse. So let's try this one more time. Now we have our complete gate to trigger converter with the TLO 74. And that's the circuit basically um, with two diodes uh, that gets rid of the negative voltage a spike from a um, 47, um, microfarad capacitor i'm sorry a 0.47 microfarad capacitor and then it's grounded the input is grounded and uh here is the final pulse so let's see it go when i push the button here's the button and it should give nine pulses and then stop Try it again. Perfect. Now, I didn't want the clock to continue running uh, once the nine clock pulses have been delivered and I wanted everything to reset. So from the uh, nine, uh, the, the ninth value, which is the 10th, uh, uh, output of the decade counter. Um, I have that signal when it goes high going through an inverter and that inverter gives a low output and that low output goes to pin four of the 555 timer which stops the timer completely and uh, that basically allows the user or the master device uh, to um, be reset by a separate circuit either with a button push button manually or with a separate uh, triggering mechanism i sped it up a little bit with a smaller capacitor at the 555 timer i put a 0.1 microfarad capacitor there 
So now when I press it, it gives you nine beats just like that. Here's what it looks like. And let's count it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it does that. So rather than triggering it manually with a button each time, I decided to use a separate 555 timer, uh, which operates with a very short uh, percent pulse width modulation duty cycle. And what uh, that does, it's also slower. And so every time the clock, um, the counter has counted up to nine and stopped, or to eight and or to nine and stopped, then this uh, separate trigger comes in, and that uh, is a very short signal, and it resets, uh, it set the, the resets the counter to zero, which um, turns off the stoppage of the timer, the original five 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 timer signal, and allows it to run all, over and over again. Using a separate five 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 timer. Um, which is right here next to the button. I have it set up for a very short, quick pulse with uh, basically by adjusting the PWM. And I have that re-triggering the receive circuit. So it looks like this. And I have it a little bit sped up, so... Um, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the down pulse. It just keeps doing that. So it makes a little bit of a break in between there to receive new data. And so right now I have it every second or so, it's getting a new read on the data. So if I was going to do two bytes worth of this, it would be about two seconds to get each byte. But I could obviously speed it up, so we'll, um, we'll work on that. Sped it up even further. See nine pulses and the down pulse on the data line consistently on each triggering. This re-triggers it, this one right here. And this is the whole process of the nine pulses going through. You can barely see it because it's so fast. But there it is. So as I have it now with the capacitors and the resistor combos on the 555 timers, uh, I can receive data um, basically once every half of a second for the entire 12 bits. And here we are receiving the data automatically. So the last part of this is to implement a way to display the data other than using an oscilloscope. And so by using the other flip-flop on the CD4013, um, I divide the re-triggering 555 timer uh, clock by two. And so every two bytes received, uh, that can latch data in a, a serial in parallel out shift register. And so to get the appropriate bits that correspond to the actual data out, you have to pick off the correct bits uh, and connect them to LEDs or some form of uh, latch chip that you want. Um, and that completes the circuit. Thanks for watching.